with our new, uh, the new year. Hope you all had a nice holiday. We had a, I can't talk over you, so, well, I probably can, but I don't want to. I'm still sort of dealing with a little bit of laryngitis, so. Uh, we are, uh, always takes a little bit of time to get into the rhythm of things, and um, yet, uh, we have to start somewhere, so we'll start and go for it. Um, what else? We're in chapter 7 in your textbook, which is Lies Women Believe About Marriage and the Truth That Sets Them Free. I hope you've had a chance oh, somewhere over the holidays or before or whatever to have a glance through the chapter. Um, at the very least, when you, when you have trouble finding time or enthusiasm for or interest in reading a whole chapter, and I totally understand that, at least go to the back of each chapter and try to look through her chart that has the lies and the truth and some scriptures, and that'll, that gives you a good overview. If you can read it, it's well. The, the chapters are well done, and they give you some some anecdotes and some examples and things like that, and that's always helpful too. And and then we'll do the first half of the workbook uh, this morning, and the next half, Lord willing, next week. Now, as I approached <clears throat> this topic, um, and prayed and prayed and prayed on what how to bring it. Um, I decided on a different course than you may think, which is not unusual for me. Uh, and we'll get to that in just a minute. I wanted something that would apply to all of us in the room. Because we are women it, of many ages and many stages. We have married women, we have widowed, we have divorced, we have single, never married. We have a lot of different things. But there are principles in the scripture that bear on the topic of marriage, but also bear on other relationships uh, that I think will help us in our marriages if we are married, and will help us in helping other women, uh, but also will help us in any other relationships which we have in life, um, which are really where our holiness and our Christianity plays out. It, it isn't just me. It is me in relationship with others in various situations, in work situations, in um, um, friendships, in um, you know um, superiors and inferiors, in, in work, and all these different things, and neighbors, and so on. So that's what I pulled out. But let's open in prayer, and then I'll tell you uh, what our scripture verses for today that we're going to look at particularly, and um, then we'll proceed. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are very grateful to you for your kindness and mercy to us, once again, to bring us together, to have a time where we can look into your word, and uh, with the help of the Holy Spirit, discern the things that you want us to know about how to live our lives uh, as Christians, and particularly as Christian women in the world. And Lord, um, no less today do you have instruction for us from your word that I pray you will bless in the teaching of it, and that the knowledge of it will uh, be transformed by you into wisdom for living, wisdom that comes from above, wisdom that rises above the culture and what those in that culture uh, say to us about what is truth. We want your truth, you are the truth, and you have given us the spirit of truth, and so we trust that you will bless this teaching to our use and to your glory, and we ask it all in Christ's name. So our text, if you want to turn there and your Bibles are on your devices, will be from 1 Peter chapter 3. Verses 1 through 6. And I will hit those verses uh, 
some of them a little briefly in, in one particular area I will center in on. We're going to read the text in a moment. But in keeping with the season and in keeping with some of the things that uh, we have seen during the Christmas time as we decorate our homes and or are in homes that are decorated, we see the church decorated, and we see uh, the courtyards of the city decorated, uh, I've decided to call this um, the ornaments of a godly woman. The ornaments of a godly woman. It's not original, the, the word ornament as used in this context. It's used by some of the older writers. But I like it because it, it goes along with what, you know, we can relate to how our trees are decorated and all that stuff. Uh, it goes along with the passage in, in terms of what really decorates and sets apart a a woman of faith as she lives out her life in the world and in the various situations of life. You're probably familiar with the passage, but I want to read it in your hearing and then give a little bit of background about what Peter is doing here and then move into the passage uh, quickly and center in on the ornaments. Really, Ideally, you could say it's one ornament, but it has two sides. But for the sake of just the flow, we'll call it ornaments. So let me begin. I'm just going to read verses 1 through 6 of 1 Peter chapter 3. This is the word of God. Likewise, wives. Likewise refers us back to previous chapter. Be subject to your own husbands. So that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle or meek and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Now, even though this instruction is given in the context of wives and husbands in this chapter, you'll nonetheless find the same principles uh, in Peter, but also in Paul and in the Old Testament, applying to all women, any age and stage, and also um, the ornament itself applying to men. But since we are women, we're going to focus in on it in our lives. I am going to uh, hone the teaching into verse 4, uh, particularly because that's where the emphasis is and I can't do justice to the whole of First Peter but he talks about wives and husbands but he also talks in the previous chapters about servants and masters and um, all people in general who profess the name of Christ now just quickly First Peter is a setting is in a setting where Peter is writing to Christians mostly Jewish Christians who were dispersed throughout the Roman Empire he probably was in Rome writing to Christians in that city but Rome also as you probably know had extensive colonies throughout the known world and particularly in Asia Minor which we now call Turkey and that area there, um, Galatia and all these different places, were under Roman rule at that time. And so he, the, the believers had been dispersed. They were living in these different uh, places. And the culture was against their Christianity. It was a pagan culture. 
And they were suffering. They were suffering pre predominantly from persecution by unbelievers, but nonetheless, they were going through hard times, and his goal was to encourage them. He encourages them first by telling them that they are holy people set apart by God. They're called to be holy because they are holy. So there is, now you are holy, you are set apart by God for Christ, you are redeemed, and you are called to live a holy life in the circumstances in which God has placed you now. Um, and so in the various relationships of their life he weaves in and out indicatives which is what is true of them with imperatives now you shall live this way and that's what I want to focus in on this morning <clears throat> he particularly as he speaks to women speaks in the context of their marriages so that applies to our teaching today but he says there may be women among you who are married to unbelieving husbands. And in that culture, in the Roman culture, women, women were expected to take up the religion of their husbands. And that would be the worship of the various gods that Rome worshipped and so on. So it's a very difficult situation. But I want you to understand it does not apply only to women with unbelieving husbands, but to all people and all women. And he also addresses in verse 7 husbands, how they're supposed to live with their wives. So this is not just written to women. And in verse 8 of the same chapter, he also speaks, finally, all of you have these qualities. He puts them in different words, but have the qualities that I've been addressing above uh, in your life. The ornaments that he's speaking about here are uh, meekness or gentleness and quietness of spirit. And he says that these are two graces that are especially prized by our Lord. He said that they are very precious in God's sight. And indeed, in other portions of the scripture, you will see that meekness or gentleness and quietness of spirit um, is an ornament that was exemplified uh, by our Lord Jesus himself. He said of himself in Matthew chapter 11, Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke on you and learn of me, for I am meek, or gentle, and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. These attributes, especially meekness, sometimes translated gentleness, it is also part of the fruit of the Spirit, which we find in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, and is contrasted with the uh, works of the flesh, one of which is uh, unruly passions, temper, anger, strife, and all these other things which are opposed to meekness and quietness of spirit. So as we look at this, I think it's good for all of us to reflect on um, how we're doing in this department of having a meek or quiet, a meek and quiet spirit. And we'll develop that now as we go in up, along. Especially will these qualities be needed in difficult circumstances, which may be the wife with an unbelieving husband, or masters and slaves, superiors who are difficult, and inferiors, neighbors, uh, all of these things. That's when we need to um, exemplify these characteristics, but the adorning should always be with us. So in this passage, Peter addresses believing women with both a negative and a positive admonition. He first starts with the negative. Verse 3. Do not let your adorning... Mm -hmm. What would be another word for adorning? Clothing. Huh? <clears throat> well, it refers to clothing, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. In this context. 
beauty. Don't, huh? Beauty. Yes, don't let you, just your beauty or your decorations that you wear be external only. Do not let your adorning be external. That's not where we're supposed to put the emphasis, he says. Such as the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. As you probably know in that culture, women of a uh, certain rank um, delighted to dress themselves with great ornamentation and it bespoke of their position or their wannabe position um, in the culture. And it was getting to be that believing women were feeling bad that they didn't have the same ornamentation uh, as these women and therefore were looked down upon or they were striving and getting their husbands to strive to get them the means by any means possible to dress the same way as the women of the culture. Now again the, the uh, qualifier is here that he's not saying that we should not take care of our outward persons. Um, in fact in the original language it's but let your adorning, I'm sorry, do not let your adorning be external, the implication in the language is only or merely external. So he's not condemning um, um, taking care of your hair, putting on jewelry, uh, wearing nice clothing, but the excess and the focus, he said, should not be on those outward matters. For Proverbs tells us in the, thir in the 31st chapter that um, beauty is vain, is empty, but it's the woman who fears the Lord that shall be praised. He says that then he gives a positive admonition, but, and we're going to develop it in a minute, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which, is, which in God's sight is very precious. Let it be the inner person of the heart. He actually uses a male pronoun, so we know that this applies to men as well when he says, actually, let your adorning be the hidden man of the heart. So he uses a masculine pronoun, uh, so it applies to all people. But in this context, of course, to the women. He said, in a sense, show outward modesty coupled with inner beauty. And he puts the emphasis on the inner qualities, the hidden person of the heart, the inward beauty. beauty. And when he talks about adorning, and when he talks about conduct of wives, some of you may have King James that might say conversation um, or your conduct, he's talking about your manner of life. And he's saying to wives that be subject to your own husbands. So there is the issue of submission here. That's not our topic today, though. Um, so that even if one, of, even if some of your husbands uh, do not obey the word, they may be one. He doesn't guarantee that they will be, but he says they may be one without you preaching to them, without the word, by the conduct of their wives. In other words, by the manner of life that they live. And that conduct, he says, is exemplified primarily by meekness or gentleness and quietness of spirit under all circumstances. And he says that this, this beauty, this adorning, is that which is imperishable because the soul is immortal. So basically he's saying, put your focus on dressing the soul as opposed to dressing your outward body. The soul is imperishable, applies, and we know it says it elsewhere in scripture, that the body is perishable. So don't put all your emphasis on that which is going to and is decaying and will decay and return to dust, but put your emphasis on that which is imperishable, immortal, which is the soul which God has given you. And this, these graces are very precious in his sight because they reflect his work of original creation 
and transformation of our natures and our persons into Christ likeness. Let's take a look just briefly at what we mean and what we don't mean here by the gentle or meek spirit and the quiet spirit. You don't hear the word meek being used very often anymore. Do you? I thought about it. I thought, it's not a word that's highly esteemed in our culture today. Um, Because it has acquired, like barnacles on the side of a boat that's been docked, the a twisted definition, a twisted a connotation goes with it. In our culture today, if you're called meek, it is not a compliment yeah. for the most part. <coughs> if you are meek, it may imply that you are weak, that you are cowardly, that you are spiritless, it means you don't have much spirit that you're, you're like a doormat. Um, and it, so it's gotten a bad reputation today. The culture has hijacked the biblical term. We need to reclaim it and use it the way the Lord uses it. But nonetheless, the scripture uses meek, sometimes translated gentle, um, in our text. And this meekness, therefore, is different than what the world thinks. And it's an inner quality that shows itself outward. And there are two directions for meekness. We are to show meekness first and foremost towards God and then towards others. So there's the vertical and the horizontal, as there are in most of these graces and fruit of the Spirit. How do we show meekness towards God? Well, in other places and even in this passage, he talks about us being subject to to the Lord's authority. We are submissive to his authority. Because we are submissive to him, then we reflect that submissiveness in other relationships as well. So submission to God's authority and to his providential dealings with us. I'm not going to go through all the ways in which we uh, show meekness towards God, but particularly subject submission to his authority, primarily through his word as it's preached and taught to us and what he says in it and his providence in our lives even and especially difficult providences difficult circumstances afflictions particularly suffering as he talks about here we fear the Lord we respect the Lord We submit to his authority and to those to whom he has given authority, which he said are the leaders of the church and even the governments under which we live, Romans tells us, are given by God. And so we submit to him because of who he is and how gracious he is. James, in the first chapter, in verse 21, the second part of the uh, verse, says that we are to receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls. Receive with meekness. Receive it as from God. As God's holy word and his authoritative word. And then show meekness towards God in whatever circumstances he chooses to put in our life, particularly when they involve suffering of some kind of persecution, um, when they go against the grain of our own will. I don't always do particularly well in that area. (laughs) Um, I'm sure you could probably say the same, but I am learning. And then, meekness towards others. By refusing to render evil for evil, as he talks about 
in verse 9 of chapter 3, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless others. So meekness towards others refers to refusing to take revenge, refusing to push our own rights, sometimes not saying anything in retaliation when we could say something back that would continue to stir up the pot as it were committing ourselves and our cause to the Lord first who will take care of us he gives the examples of the Lord Jesus in chapter 2 verse 23 when he was reviled he did not revile in return When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And Isaiah 53 says that Jesus was like a lamb who did not open its mouth. But he entrusted himself to God. Didn't mean that he didn't ask God to take away the cup, if it were possible, but he submitted to the will of God seeing the affliction as coming from the hand of God, not particularly and immediately from the hand of the Romans or anyone else, although they were uh, doing the actual persecution of him. So, meekness or gentleness towards God and towards others. We don't seek to get even. The the best example of how to show meekness Uh, is captured in, or one of the best, is in James chapter 1 again, how it plays out in our lives. I'm going the wrong way. James chapter 1, you're familiar with this, I'm sure. Chapter 1, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Then he goes on to talk about putting away filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So one of the ways we can see meekness played out is when we are quicker, quick to hear. That means we're attentive, we listen. We're slower to speak in response and we're slow to be stirred up into a state of anger. <coughs> That's meekness. Has the idea of the restraint put on our fleshly passions. We control them, they don't control us. Meekness would be like the bridle in the horse's mouth that the rider pulls to restrain the horse from galloping away and holds it back from going over the cliff or running away with itself. We're supposed to pull that bridle of meekness when our passions start to become inflamed. And remember to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, and not render evil for evil, not retaliate, and so on not make it our business to get even. Passions under control. So it really means strength. It it really takes great inner strength to restrain your passions. To be disciplined in controlling your words and your actions. Natural tendency for us is to let them run away with us. Be controlled by them. And yell and scream and throw a fit. Huh? React. Yes. And so when we are able to be meek and gentle as Jesus was, and you know Jesus was full of, endured the suffering that he endured, endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, and yet was meek and gentle of heart. Strength under control, passion under control is what God calls us to. This is an ornament that is imperishable, 
It is the product of the Holy Spirit, and it is gives us an imperishable beauty, the scripture says, which is very precious in God's sight. Now, the quiet spirit is often misunderstood as well. When he talks about a gentle or meek and quiet spirit, we think, even in the Christian community, that it means that you don't speak. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that you don't speak up or speak out if the situation warrants it. It's the manner with which you do it. But predominantly, a quiet spirit doesn't have to do with the speech, first and foremost, but with the inner condition of your soul, your inner life. It has the idea in this context, and has more to do with inner peace and tranquility of soul in all situations, particularly difficult situations, that your inner world is not fragmented, but is united and is like a calm sea, not tumultuous within. That's what it primarily means. And when within we have and are cultivating this quietness of spirit, this tranquility of soul, this peace in the inner life, it shows itself on the outside in gentleness and self-control and all the other fruit of the Spirit. It, too, is very precious in God's sight. It is a product of the Spirit uh, at work within us. And yet, uh, we are called to ask God to produce these things in us, to seek after them, to pray to God for them, and to exercise them. In fact, Colossians 3.12 says, put on meekness and gentleness, like a garment. Again, your garment should be these qualities. These are to dress you and me. We must seek it. Ask the Lord for these qualities. Learn about them by studying Christ and his word, looking unto Jesus. And Timothy tells us in 1 Timothy 6.11, or Paul tells Timothy, actually, to follow after meekness. It has the idea of a sincere desire and a sincere endeavor to get the mastery of your passions. First Timothy, what place? Six and eleven. Thank you. Six and verse eleven. Tells, tells this young minister, follow after meekness. Follow after it. Seek it out. Pursue it. Um, to get the mastery of your passions so that it's put on display draw out this grace into exercise by your words or lack of words sometimes even our countenance and our actions and reactions Um, 1 Thessalonians 4.11 is a good passage to Kind of capture what we're talking about here. Uh, where am I? First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 11. <clears throat> it talks about brotherly love. The will of God is your sanctification. Chapter 4, verse 11. Aspire. To live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. And Titus tells us that the older women are to teach the younger women. It, in, it, it intimates that older women have grasped this concept <laughs> somewhat and are manifesting this ornament somewhat and are decked out in this somewhat and are therefore able to teach the younger women the beauty of these qualities as well as give an example um, to them 
You know the beatitude in Matthew 5, chapter 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, We know that we inherit more than the earth. If we just inherited the earth, that wouldn't be such a great thing. But we inherit eternal life. We inherit, um, in, in, in a sense... We go back to the original creation where we're not dominated by the things of the earth and the earthly wisdom and the ways of the earth or the world, but uh, we've sort of risen above it by godliness. And then he goes on to give the example of Sarah and some of the holy women. Now, we kind of poo-hoo the, the, this business of submitting to our own husbands and as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. I certainly don't go around calling my husband Lord. But it's see, I they did in that culture. Um, but I do seek, by God's grace, to respect my husband and to submit to my husband. And my husband is a kind of person, thanks be unto God, who seeks to protect me, to look after me, and to advise me, and to put an umbrella of protection over me. But he takes my counsel, asks for it, and then decides before God what he's going to do with it. Most of the time, uh, I would have to say most of the time he takes it. Um, But sometimes he chooses another path, and I know that that's because that's what God has shown him. Um, But I hope that we can strive this year uh, together and encourage one another together to, to seek to be more concerned about our inner life than our outer life. doesn't mean we neglect our outer being or how we look or, you know, to put on a little bit of makeup or to have a little work done if we need it, I guess. I don't know. I would like to, but I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, a little work done. Um, Go to the gym, eat healthy, do what we can um, are good things, and they make us more useful to the kingdom of God when we're healthy and so on. But I want you to ponder, as we end here, uh, and I haven't done justice to the passage, but ponder, do I spend as much time cultivating my inner life as I do my outward adorning? I want you to ponder that and go before the Lord and ask him. In other words, do I I seek to dress by God's grace and have him dress my soul, which is imperishable, more than my body, which is perishable? And if we do, God tells us this pursuit and this work of adornment will prove beneficial not only to our marriages, but to all our relationships and to our own health and well-being. A lot less ulcers, a lot less crazy living, frantic living, discontentment, aggravation, Frustration, blood pressure, out of blood control. pressure out of control. Fewer medications required in quieting us. Doesn't mean that they're all bad. I'm not saying that. But it's to the glory of God, and it brings great glory on God and His Word when we seek to live this way by the grace of God. I will not say that it's easy, but I will say that it is possible because God said it is possible. It is what we were redeemed for, is to be like Christ. And so he will do this work in us as we seek it, as we study on it, as we pray about it, as we seek to exercise it. Uh, We'll get a handle on these things more and more. Can I just say something? Yeah. The Lord has given me that as far as dig deeper for this year, this new year, dig deeper to glorify the Lord. Dig deeper where? Oh, oh. You mean in, me. in you? In my oh, yes. yes. In, in, in his, from his word and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dig, to dig deeper. And, and to do that, you have to, ladies, you have to slow down a little bit. Mm-hmm. Young women, you've got to slow down a little bit. I heard that. 
<laughs> at every mistake, I used to tell my students, I can't see worth a darn. I wear far, middle, and near trifocals, but I have great right hair. <laughs> Nothing slips by. Nothing um, It is much easier to do than to be. It is, it's much easier to do things, to flit about, go from one thing to another to another. And we older women sometimes do that as well, um, especially at certain seasons in our lives. And some of it's fine. Some of it's fine. I'm not. You, you have to go before the Lord and, and with him decide what you should do and what you shouldn't do. But I will tell you, it is much easier to flit about and go from place to place and do, do, do than it is to be. And God calls us first to be and then to do. We are to be and then do out of our being. We are to do out of the resources of our inner being, as he did. Fill up the inner, and the outer will fall into place. All right, so the ornaments. Be decked. Try to be deck yourself with meekness and gentleness of spirit. Psalm 131, I'll end with verse 6, says... I have calmed and quieted my soul, David said, like a weaned child. It's one of my favorite little bitty psalms. What was that reference? Uh, Psalm 131, particularly verse 6, applies here. So it's something God does, but it's something we cooperate with God in. And sometimes you just have to step back and go, okay, I'm not going to say anything about this. (laughs) <laughs> um, I don't want that to fragment me inwardly. Yeah. Yes, Jen. Yeah. Add one more thing. You talked in the past about being victorious and um, sort of what we were talking about today with Sarah. An aha moment for me was when Susan Hunt in a conference mentioned Sarah, which she had a great sin in being impatient and yeah. uh, with her husband and having Ishmael and all the yeah. problems they had. So we've all had our own issues with our husband or big mistakes and you know big sins in our lives but we have, we can still as redeemed women can live victorious lives and look like yes. you know, he admires her here yes. and we're her daughters because we're redeemed yes. and he uses us through our mistakes yeah as abraham is the father of believers in a sense sarah is the mother of all believers and mm-hmm. and uh, we are we're to look to these holy women who who did make mistakes but who sought to live um um, meek and gentle and quiet lives in their various circumstances of life. Okay, um, that's it for now. Hope it will prove profitable and uh, we'll go to our table work. If you have any thoughts or other questions, you can speak up or you can give them to me or you can ask them to your leaders.